Kia ora everyone, my name is Nikki Roy, I'm Support Services Coordinator for Leukemia and Blood Cancer New Zealand here in Wellington. Welcome to our webinar today, COVID-19 in 2023, an update for people with blood cancers, presented by Dr Rob Winecove. Before I introduce Rob, just want to let you know that we will be recording the session today and you do have the opportunity to send questions in and you can do that by hitting the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing that question in. And then at the end of uh, Rob's presentation, we will go through um, as many of those as, as we can. And uh, it's my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Robert Winecove with us today. He is a hematologist at Wellington Blood and Cancer Center and clinical director at the Maligan Institute of Medical Research. After studying medicine at the University of Cambridge and King's College London, he trained in haematology in London and Germany and undertook a PhD in immunology at the University of Otago. Rob's research interests include B-cell malignancies, immunology and supportive care. Rob leads a chimeric antigen receptor, CAR T-cell development program at the Maligan Institute and is the principal investigator for ENABLE, New Zealand's phase one CAR T-cell trial. Thank you, Rob. Welcome and over to you. Thanks very much, Nikki, and thanks for the um, opportunity to speak today. So, um, as you all know, we've been living with this um, uh, virus now for just over three years. And uh, for all of us, it turned our lives around um, uh, for the first couple of years. And, and no group of patients more so than, than, than those of you who are living with or who are living with other people who are living with blood cancers. Um, so I'm just going to um, summarize a bit of where the virus is up to. I come from the angle, I'm a haematologist. I'm not, I'm not an infectious diseases physician, but I have taken part in some of the, the uh, some various national meetings around the COVID response. And I'm involved in um, so-called the Supportive Care Working Party uh, 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 by the Australasian Leukemia and Lymphoma Group. And we've um, produced some guidelines early on in the pandemic for um, helping to manage people with, with um hematologic cancers getting through COVID-19 and also helping to plan um, some of our cancer services. So I guess the first thing I wanted to, to, to point out is that um, we're in a much better position than, than we were with this virus um, a few years ago. So as, as many of you will know, early on um, during the pandemic, particularly in countries that had enormous outbreaks of COVID-19 before we had vaccines, before we had antiviral therapies, um, a lot of people died of COVID-19 and people with blood cancers in many cases were particularly badly hit. I mean, there are some series out of the UK and, and Europe where among people who were diagnosed with COVID-19, but noting that at that time, even the testing wasn't that widely available, there, there were um, mortality rates of risks of dying of it of, as, as high as 30 or 40 percent, really terrible statistics um, that um, still may sit with many of you today. I just want to reassure that um, those statistics are not relevant um, in, in today's world. So now in the era of vaccines, in the era of antiviral therapies, in the era of Omicron, which does appear to be a, a milder variant of the virus than some of the earlier versions, particularly there's one called Delta um, that appeared to be more severe than the original one. In, in the era today, um, those statistics are much improved. So um, the, the, the mortality rates, that is the risk of dying with COVID-19, are about a tenth of what they were even among immune suppressed people um, at, early on in the outbreak. Uh, the chance of getting um, admitted to hospital and requiring oxygen or ventilation is much lower than it was around a fifth of what it was um, earlier on in the outbreak. So um, it's it's not very helpful still to be focusing on those statistics from the papers in 2020 because the scenario has changed. There's more population immunity. Um, most people with blood cancers have been vaccinated. We do have antiviral therapies. And so all these things are, are, are good. But nonetheless, it's still a virus we have to be aware of and particularly... Um, those of you who are immune suppressed and those of you who are getting um, uh, anti-cancer treatments at the moment where your risk is likely to be higher, or for those of you who have got multiple risk factors. So a lot of people with blood cancers will have other risk, proven risk factors for getting sicker with COVID-19, such as um, uh, um, you know, age over 70, for example, or some of you might also have kidney disease or diabetes that might contribute to risk as well. So, um, I guess um, the mainstay of protection against COVID-19 for most of us, um, including people with blood cancers, 
is um, vaccination. And in fact, vaccinations changed uh, and it's changed very recently. So we were discussing having this having this uh, uh, seminar a couple of weeks ago, but I'm glad we deferred it um, because we've seen a government announcement since then about uh, a new COVID vaccine. And I did want to just um, focus on that for a moment. So people with blood cancers have been recognized at a number of steps through the government's um, vaccine response as being at higher risk. And if you have a blood cancer, or at least many of you with blood cancers will be eligible for um, three doses as part of the primary cause course of vaccination, plus um, up to two vote booster doses. So what's been currently funded is up to five COVID-19 vaccines for people um, who whose immune system is, is severely weakened. And in fact, for some people, it may be even more of that, more than that, because for some people with a bone marrow transplant, they may be eligible to repeat their vaccinations. So, so um, hopefully many of you or most of you will be vaccinated and many of you may have had three, four or five vaccines um, by this point. Um, so to, to, to that and it's worth pointing out what's changed with the vaccine. So the original vaccines, the original Pfizer vaccine that most of you uh, will have had um, contained one, uh, I'm just actually gonna share a screen and show you an illustration of this for a moment, um, contained one bit of mRNA. So this, this presentation, some of you might have seen a slide like this that I've produced in the past. And what I've done on the left is shown you uh, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes um, COVID-19 disease. And as you can see, it's a it's a complicated piece. It's actually very tiny, much smaller than a cell. You need an electron microscope to be able to see it. But it's basically um, a virus that's made up of um, genetic code. So about um, 26 different genes of worth of genetic code. And it's made up of some certain proteins and a lipid coat. And um, particularly prominent on this virus is something called the spike protein that you might have heard of. And the spike protein is what helps this virus target cells, particularly cells in or around our lungs, and get into those cells, um, hijack them and make more copies of itself. So on the left there is an illustration of the, the, the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the um, COVID-19 disease. And the type of vaccine that we've had for a while is in the middle. Um, it's what I've called the mRNA vaccine. It's what we now call the original virus a vaccine, which is a monovalent vaccine. And what that did was it took just the bit of genetic code that encodes that spike protein and a capsule around the outside, just a, a sort of lipid capsule, a fatty coat that is required in order to make it stable and make it able to be expressed. And what happens with that vaccine is it's injected into our arms, it gets into some of our cells, like our muscle cells, and our own body cells then make the spike protein. But because it's only that protein, it can't make more copies of itself, it can't infect our lung cells, um, but it can elicit an immune response against the spike protein that can help protect us if we see the virus itself later on. And that's what that original Pfizer mRNA vaccine did. What's meant by the bivalent vaccine is it's got two slightly different versions of the spike protein. So over time, over the last three years, the virus, um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has been gradually changing. This is not unexpected. This happens with um, most common respiratory viruses. So if you look at influenza, the, the vaccine gets updated each year according to the variants that come along. Um, the virus is subject to um, sort of evolutionary pressure um, is it, as, it, as um, our bodies make many, many different copies of the virus during an infection. The versions that are best able to evade or uh, uh, you know, miss out on an immune response are the ones that are more likely to spread onto the next person. And what's happened is that over time, the as the virus has changed, it's become, it's diverged from the spike protein that um, was present in the original vaccine that, that most of us received. And that means that original vaccine is now less effective against the current, current variants than it was at the beginning. Now, what this bivalent vaccine does is it contains the same amount of um, genetic code, but it's split. Half of it's the original version and half of it's a slightly altered spike protein um, that actually comes from the original Omicron variants, BA4 and BA5. So it's it contains two different versions of the spike protein that allow it to both cover the original COVID-19 virus, but also cover um, the earlier versions of the Omicron virus. 
And that gives us better protection against Omicron. It otherwise is effectively exactly the same as the prior vaccines that you've received in the past. And these are very, very safe types of vaccine that have been given to um, hundreds of millions, or in the case of the original Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine, now billions um, of patients. And um, the reason that's important is the variants of COVID-19 have been changing over time. So this, this shows um, the variants over time in New Zealand. And this is New Zealand data from ESR, um, accessed as of today, actually, from wastewater. So basically what, what um, the government's organisations have been doing is they've been sampling wastewater from around the country and looking at what versions of the virus can be detected using sensitive gene techniques in the wastewater. And that's a useful way of screening what's around in the community. And if you look at one of the earlier versions of the vaccine, um, back in... Uh, about uh, eight or nine months ago, almost all of it was a version of the virus called BA2. And then you can see in yellow the rise of Omicron um, over late 2022 and uh, up until the end of last year. And this is the BA4, BA5 version of Omicron. So that's what we've been going through um, last year and more recently. And in fact, the variants we have are still largely termed Omicron variants because partly because they've stopped they've stopped um, finding trying to find new Greek uh, alphabet letters to the same extent as the virus has become more endemic. Um, what you can see now over the last few months is emergence of a number of sort of sub variants. So um, it's no longer the case that we have just one variant accounting for the vast majority. We've got a variety of different variants. And the important thing I would say is that most of these variants are well covered by this new bivalent vaccine. Um, and this, this is a strong reason to be getting this vaccine to boost your protection. Um, some of us will, some of you online will have had these variants, have been exposed to them, so you'll have your own immune responses against those. Some of you might not have seen that yet, but might have seen Omicron or an earlier version. I will sound one uh, note of caution about these bivalent vaccines. This is this particular strain in the sort of bright green XBB that you can just see a little uh, around 10% of infections in the most recent data. That version, in particularly in patients specifically with blood cancers, the protection afforded by the bivalent vaccine against that particular version looks to be a little bit lower. Um, still quite good in people whose immune system is very robust, but in a study specifically of people with blood cancers, the level of protection against that particular variant was a bit lower. So the vaccine that's coming along is great, and it's going to provide um, a lot of additional protection to most of us against most of the variants. But we have to be a bit careful and not be, be aware that it may not provide full protection against all the variants that are coming along. We don't know what will happen to this variant XBB. It may sink away as some of the other variants have again, like this one shown in um, orange here, the BQ1.1, appears to be coming back down, or it may grow in frequency. We don't really know that yet. So we have to be a bit cautious and just because we have these new vaccines and these new vaccines doesn't mean we need to abandon all other measures um, to protect ourselves against the virus, if, if particularly if we're at very high risk. So who's at the highest risk of, of, of COVID-19? And this is quite difficult because um, all of us have different risk factors and different risk factors combined. But um, blood cancers themselves are believed to be a risk factor. And I think within that, what we're seeing is that some people are at higher risk than others. So the people that are, we think are at highest risk are people currently getting really intensive therapy. So those of you who are getting intensive chemotherapy for acute myeloid or acute lymphoblastic leukemia, that does seem to be a particular risk factor. People who have recently had a bone marrow transplant, um, so either an autologous or an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, and people who are late after a bone marrow transplant, but who are still on immune suppression. So if you've had an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, even some years ago, but you're still on steroids or other treatments for graft versus host disease, that probably puts you at a particularly in a particularly high risk group. And the other group that's possibly even bigger is people who are currently on treatments that suppress their B cells. So a lot of blood cancers are cancers of B cells, and that is um, B cell lymphomas, um, myeloma, and um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. 
And if you're if you've got one of those conditions, you're currently on a treatment that suppresses your B cells. That means you can't really make antibodies. So your ability to protect yourself against the virus is diminished. And uh, so I'm particularly thinking about people who are currently getting rituximab or, have, or, who, or who have had it in the last six to 12 months. People who are getting those B cell inhibi inhibit inhibiting medicines for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, like venetoclax, uh, ibrutinib, um, or similar medicines used in clinical trials. Um, and there's not so many of these, but people who are getting, who've recently received CAR T cell therapies um, or um, uh, antibody therapies for myeloma, such as um, uh, daratumumab. Those types of treatment, they basically knock out our body's ability to make antibodies and therefore defend ourselves against viral infections. And for people in those groups, you probably need to be watching out and be a bit more cautious than others. Um, the reason that's important is because uh, there's not a lot of mask wearing in the community. We're still wearing masks when we're in the hospitals, um, but in the community is a lot less mask wearing than there was. Um, and to be honest, the degree of protection afforded by simple surgical masks or cloth masks, especially if they're you know, worn fairly loosely, is, is not that great. And I think if I was in um, a situation where I was in that one of those higher risk groups, you know, currently on a B cell inhibitor, you know, recently had a bone marrow transplant um, uh, or currently getting intensive chemotherapy, I'd give serious consideration to wearing um, what we call an N95 or, or a P2 mask. These are the tighter fitting masks that provide a higher level of protection against um, aerosolized viruses, because this is a respiratory virus and it can spread via the air, at least when you're in sort of shared environments, if you're in a bus, if you're in a cinema, um, if you're in the supermarket, there's enclosed environments when there's lots of people around. Um, you may have to make your own judgment about whether you really want to wear that at home where you're being exposed to a smaller number of people. Um, and there's probably less risk outdoors where there's much better ventilation naturally. Um, so, you know, it's it's important that you, you know, there is a, there is a trade off here with mask wearing of of being able to communicate with people, being able to get that social connection. And if I was, for example, going for a walk with a friend outside, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily wear a mask in, in that environment. But I would be cautious if I'm in those large shared environments with many people, if I was in that highest risk group. Um, it's also important that you're aware um, of what to do if you do develop symptoms of COVID. So there's lots of respiratory viruses and not every cough or cold is going to be COVID. It might be another virus infection. So I would recommend um, that people with blood cancers do test themselves with those antigen tests if they develop symptoms of COVID-19. And that particularly if you test positive, that you register that result and that you get medical advice because there are tablet antiviral medicines that do appear to be very effective. And even with the newer COVID um, variants, these, these antiviral tablets, particularly the one called Paxlovid, um, remain very effective at um, reducing the risk of getting very unwell and needing to go into hospital with COVID-19 infections. So I do recommend getting um, getting medical advice. Many pharmacies now can actually issue um, antiviral medicines without a prescription, a so-called prescription, own, uh, sort of, um, sorry, pharmacy only medicine. It does depend on whether the pharmacist has had the right training to be allowed to do that. And um, there are, uh, on some of the government websites about COVID-19, you can actually do a search for pharmacies that um, do offer offer that directly. So if it's difficult to get to see a GP, I'm aware that a lot of GPs are very busy at the moment and it can be difficult to get appointments. You, uh, you can um, consider contacting a pharmacy directly. You may be able to get a prescription for an antiviral medicine directly from a pharmacist. Uh, just to say there are a few um, barriers to that. The pharmacist has to have to has to be able to check that you've had a, a your kidney function checked in the last year and they'll have to know what other medicines you're on and check that there's nothing that interferes with them. But uh, you can get um, COVID antivirals directly from a pharmacy. It's also possible and might be worth doing if you're in a very high risk group, particularly if you are in a part of the country where it's difficult to get medical advice quickly. Maybe your GPs are very, you know, very difficult to get hold of or the pharmacies, um, you know, it can be difficult to get to get hold of them at short notice. You can um, uh, ask your GP or um, a haematologist um, to issue a, a so-called advanced prescription. And what that is, is that 
um, there's a special type of prescription where we prescribe the antiviral medicine. and We have to put some special text on it to say that it's an advanced prescription only to be issued by the pharmacy if you test positive for COVID-19. And so basically what that does is it means you can present it to any pharmacy, uh, tell them you've tested positive for COVID and they give you the tablets and then you can um, go ahead and take them. So there is that method as well. Uh, if you're particularly if you go in a more remote part of the country, you might find it difficult to um, to get medical advice at the time of an infection. So I do recommend that you get yourself tested. I do recommend uh, the antiviral medicines. There are some constraints. So the best antiviral medicine we have at the moment is this one called Paxlovid. It's a tablet medicine. It does interfere with a lot of other medications. So the pharmacist or doctor who's prescribing it needs to look over your, your other medicines. And we may, for example, ask you to pause other medications while you're taking it, or we may have to ask you to take the other tablet antiviral called molnupiravir, which is probably a bit less effective, but doesn't have the issue of interfering with as many other medications. It's important if you do have COVID, even if you're on one of these antiviral medicines, uh, that you register the results on my COVID record. Um, it just um, makes sure that your GP is notified of your infection. And it's also important that if you're getting more unwell with your infection, if you're getting very short of breath, if you're really unwell, having difficulty eating or drinking, you have to get yourself to medical advice to an out of hours center if you need to, or even the hospital emergency department, because there are other intravenous antiviral medicines that we can give uh, in a hospital setting that can't be used in the community. And, um, you know, th there are occasional instances of people getting quite sick at home and perhaps it could have um, sought advice um, earlier um, and gotten to hospital earlier to get checked out and make sure the oxygen levels are okay and see if there's a role for these intravenous antivirals in that situation. One medicine that some of you may have had that we're no longer recommending now is a medicine called Evusheld. That was an, a medicine that's given via an injection into the usually into the buttocks, um, and it was an antibody against COVID-19. Um, that was very good against the main Omicron variants that we had last year, but it's not as good against the newer variants this year. It doesn't seem to match those the variants we have now very well. So we now believe that less than a third of the variants are susceptible to every shell, and we're not currently giving top-up doses or recommending that for this reason. Um, so we don't have good antibodies or preventative in antibodies that we can give people against COVID-19. So we are really reliant on vaccination, um, tablet antiviral medicines, and for high risk people, particularly um, good, mass, good mask use. Um, so I'm gonna come on to it in a moment about this um, uh, vaccine and what it means. So there's a few uh, things to be aware of, and I might just share, share another slide with some links, because it's probably the best way of sort of, um, of, of showing you um, what's around there. So there is some government advice about people who are at high risk of COVID-19. And I've put a, a link there. It's on the COVID-19 government website. And there's a specific page of advice for people at higher risk of severe illness. And that applies to most people with blood cancers. This new bivalent vaccine that's been announced. Now, it is available to everybody um, over the age of 30 from the 1st of April, and bookings will open for that vaccine. They're said to be opening from late eight, late March. I don't have a specific date, um, but you should be able to um, go on to bookmyvaccine.health.nz uh, from late March uh, to be able to directly book your dose of the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine. Um, now, for those of you who are due a booster anyway, uh, but ha who haven't yet had all their boosters, you can actually get your bivalent vaccine as your booster now. So if you still have an extra booster dose that you haven't yet received, you can go on to boost, book, um, uh, book my vaccine and book your booster dose that you're already, already eligible for and have that as your um, uh, the bivalent uh, vaccine as your booster dose. Um, so that's just a tip. If you're still due a, due a booster, um, you may be able to get the bivalent vaccine uh, already. Now, um, why over only, th only over 30 year olds? It's clear that um, age is a risk factor for getting more unwell with COVID-19 infections. And that risk is not just a, a sudden jump at 30, of course, that risk gradually increases as we get older. And uh, young people, um, you know, children and young adults are at very low risk of getting severely ill with COVID-19, unless they've got an extra major risk factor. If you're under 30 and you've got a, a blood cancer, you can still get the bivalent vaccine, but you'll 
probably need a prescription for it. And your GP could issue that or you could contact your specialist. There won't be that many of you in that group. You know, we're not asking for every single person to contact us. Um, so most of you, please get it through the normal routes. Just book it directly and get it directly. You don't need to necessarily contact your, your specialist. But if you are under 30 and you want to get it and get a prescription, um, I don't think any of us would mind being contacted to organize a prescription and help out making sure that you can get it when you need to. Um, now, um, uh, what perhaps is a, is, a, is a harder question and hasn't really um, hit our clinics yet is what if you're um, uh, under 30 and you don't have a blood cancer, but you're living with someone, say you're the partner of somebody with a blood cancer and you want to get it. I think that's a reasonable strategy. Um, the bivalent vaccine isn't currently being offered to children, but if you're um, between 18 and 30 and you're living with someone um, with uh, who's at very high risk of COVID-19, you can request to have the vaccine. Whether it's really helpful for your own health is a, is a moot point. But if you have, as long as you haven't had a bad reaction to prior versions, it wouldn't be unreasonable, just on the basis that it may help protect um, your loved ones and try and reduce the risk for them as well. Um, now, a few other tips I've put on here. So um, rapid antigen tests, you can't uh, most of us can't get free um, rapid antigen tests very easily, but it is possible to get them um, on the website of given there, request rats.covid19.health.nz. Um, I mean, for me personally, I've just been buying the occasional set, as you know, they're easy to buy now from pharmacies. But if you're particularly if you're a patient with blood cancer, I think it'd be a reasonable thing for you to go to that website and you can request to pick up a free rapid antigen test. And also some of those same pre free um, testing sites uh, also offer free face masks uh, to people that are at high risk. So if you're one of that group that um, if you've got a blood cancer, particularly if you're currently getting chemotherapy, you're B cell depleted, you've recently had a transplant, consider both requesting a, a pack of rapid antigen tests so that you have those at home to test yourself and consider also um, requesting a free box of um, high quality face masks for yourself to use in your own, uh, communal environments. And that health point uh, website that I've given there uh, actually has a map. You can actually search for testing sites across the across the country, and you can select specifically looking for testing sites that have free face masks to give away. And um, you can book in uh, with those to collect your rapid antigen tests and hopefully get a box of free face masks for yourself as well. So that's just a, a tip. You can always buy these again from pharmacies. There was a time earlier in the pandemic when it was very, very hard to get hold of these face masks. They're much more available now. Um, and and it is it is worth protecting yourself if you're in that very high risk group. Um, Antiviral medicines, there's quite a lot of information online. I just point to the covid19.government website as a, as a useful resource. It's got links on to individual medicines and more information about them and their side effects that you might want to look at. And finally, just to point out that if you um, are at high risk of COVID-19, you need to have a doctor's visit regarding COVID-19. If you've got an infection, you're getting antiviral medicines you should be eligible for free healthcare. So those of us who aren't at high risk, we now have to pay for our appointments. That's since um, February uh, this year. Um, not all COVID-19 GP visits are free anymore. Um, they, they can be charged for, for many of us in the same way as otherwise. But if you're in high risk, there are some eligibility criteria to get free doctor's visits. So have a look at that link. Basically, what happens is that the GPs can claim for those visits um, uh, and um, get reimbursed through that route instead. So that's a good, a good tip um, for those of you who want to take a look. Um, and, and then I guess um, some other uh, pro tips, and I'll put these, this, I'm putting a bit of a summary slide before we get to questions. My, my key advice is to take up the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine when you can. If you haven't had your first or second booster yet, you should be able to book that now and you should be able to get the bivalent dose as your booster dose, otherwise available from uh, the 1st of April with um, hopefully the ability to book from the last, sometime in the last week of March. Do have a test if you develop symptoms. And uh, if you do test positive, you should be able to get a prescription from many pharmacies directly, otherwise uh, on prescription from a GP or, or your specialist. Um, it is meant to go through pharmacies and GPs now rather than everything coming through your hematology department. What we've been saying to our, in, at least in our own department in Wellington is um, go through pharmacy or GP if you can. 
if you're having difficulties and we are conscious that there's some GP surgeries that are getting hard to get hold of at the moment, then we don't mind being contacted um, um, from time to time. We do what we can to facilitate a prescription. Register your result. You meant to register the result, whether it's positive or negative, but most importantly, positive results on my COVID record. And then just one other thing is that if you are testing positive for COVID on a rapid antigen test and you're due a clinic appointment or a day unit appointment for a transfusion, please call ahead and let them know. Um, we might want to change. This is really for the sake of other immune suppressed patients there. We might suggest changing your appointment to a telephone call. We might suggest deferring it by a couple of weeks if we think it's safe to do so. Or if you really need a blood transfusion or chemotherapy, we might want to take special measures and ask for you to come in you know, wearing an extra special face mask and uh, many units will have a special area for people with COVID um, so that we can just minimize the chance of spreading COVID to other immune suppressed patients in our, in our hospitals and in our departments. So please call ahead if you're testing positive. If you do test positive, even if you're on antivirals, please get medical advice. You can call um, Healthline or, or, or look online or, or attend an out-of-hours center or an emergency department if you're getting more unwell with it. Please don't um, suffer in silence. There are still some people, you know, maybe one in five, one in 10 who might get unwell and might need to come to hospital with COVID-19 with blood cancers. Um, and we'd rather um, see people and check them out than let people get very, very sick and, and need intensive care, for example. And if you're in that group that I talked about at high, very high risk, you know, intensive chemotherapy, recent bone marrow transplant, B cell depleting um, uh, therapies, or if you've got a blood cancer plus you're elderly and you're diabetic and you've got bad lung disease, um, you may consider that you might be someone who wants to be super careful about wearing a, a, a high quality face mask. And although there's no um, standard recommendation for this, if I was in that very high risk group, um, I would consider getting hold of a, uh, one of these home oxygen monitors, they're called pulse oximeters. Um, my, 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 Word of caution about these pulse oximeters, they're quite easy to buy. So a lot of pharmacies will sell them. Um, you can buy them online, you can buy them on Trade Me. If you are buying them, particularly on Trade Me or some of the you know more marginal websites, just try and check they got some sort of quality mark associated with them. Um, there's a bit of question about whether all of the ones uh, being imported are really good quality for picking up low oxygen levels. Um, uh, so there's a couple of quality marks that you can look for. For example, you can see if it's got either FDA, so that's the American um, clearance system. You can see if it's got FDA clearance, or in Australia, there's the uh, TGA clearance. Uh, those are sort of marks that has had some sort of quality assurance around it. There's also something called CE mark, which is the Council of Europe mark, which is another quality mark for items like this. Um, and that can be a good way of just checking that you're not running a very low oxygen level without realizing it. And if you're persistently running an oxygen level of less than 93% during a COVID infection, that would be, a, a, um, to my mind, a reason to um, get some healthcare advice to see if you perhaps ought to be in hospital for, you know, with some oxygen supplementation or for some closer monitoring. So those are really my top tips of where things are at. And I guess um, we'll, we'll take a few questions of which I see already a few have come through. I'll let perhaps Nikki go through those and put them to me. I hope some of that thing that has been useful. I'm going to stop the screen share. Sorry. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Rob. It's reassuring to hear that things have improved since 2020, but obviously still um, some considerations for people. Um, so if I just read these questions out for you, we may have covered them in some ways, but I had the Evershield injection first December last year. Am I able to have the new COVID-19 bivalent vaccine that is due out for this winter? And the, and the answer to that is yes, absolutely. So um, Evershield does not make you ineligible for the vaccine. Um, there were some theoretical concerns that vaccines might not work well if given within the first three weeks of Evershield. But um, yeah, I, if you've had Evershield back on the 1st of December, um, the level of protection against the current variants is probably not as good as it was um, when you first got when you got it. So I would recommend booking in for that bivalent vaccine. You should be eligible just as anyone else. Great, thank you. Um, I've already had the five vaccines. Um, will I still be able to get the one, new one, the bivalent, at some point or another booster at some point? Uh, is it going to be six months post the last booster? So, so yes. Um, so uh, you're not eligible to get the bivalent one right now because you've already had your, your five, but you are eligible to get the bivalent one from the 1st of April based on that information. So, um, 
if you've if you've just had an um a, a covid virus infection in the last three months or just had um th then it's probably less useful for you to get the um bivalent vaccine on the first of april you might want to wait until it's three months since your infection because you probably already just had exposure to those um antigens anyway from the virus itself but from almost all other people you can go ahead and get the bivalent vaccine yes great thank you i'm traveling to australia in april i've had four vaccine shots with the last one being july as well as evershield shot in november should i be getting a further vaccine prior to going i i would yes um so grant i would get um get that so um one thing is I'm not quite, it can be quite, it's a bit of a nuanced point, but I'm not sure whether your four vaccine shots were classified on the electronic system as two initial shots plus two boosters or three primary doses plus one booster. If it was three primary doses plus one booster, you might be eligible for a second booster now. So you might, you might be able to go on to the Book My Vaccine website right now, and you might find that you can actually book a second booster dose um, in the next couple of weeks before you go to Australia, and that would uh, that that would hope then hopefully be the bivalent that you're given. Um, so you might be able to get the bivalent vaccine dose now before the first of April and and before you travel. If not, um, just wait until the first of April and see if you can get get it early before your trip. Uh, but yes, I would recommend going ahead and getting that. Right. Uh, another one that's sort of similar about travelling overseas and the pharmacy will not give it to them until they have COVID. I guess people are hoping to get the medicine to take with them. So I've had that question a few times and um, that's a tricky situation. So um, I guess, um, you know, Pharmac has this con constrained budget, more was given specifically for COVID um, medicines. And I guess you can see why they've not really prioritized providing um, back pocket medicines for people in case they develop an infection while they're in another country. Unfortunately, there is also, uh, well, maybe there is now, but to my knowledge, no way to go and buy a dose of the medicine yourself. Cause you know, you might say, well, I'll pay for it myself. But as far as I'm aware, they're still not um, allowing self-pay to get these antivirals. So, um, I guess there isn't a clear solution for that. In many countries, it will be possible to get an, one of those antivirals while you're overseas. Um, some, some countries allow people to buy these medicines over the counter. Some countries will have their own setup that, that make it quite easy to get hold of when you're in, you have to do your own research really for your own travel. Um, so that's one option. Um, another option, uh, um, you could get hold of an advanced prescription, but of course, a New Zealand prescription isn't valid in another country, but you might be able to use that to show to a pharmacy to, to help them give you it as a prescription only medicine, at least give them some assurance mm -hmm. that you're an at-risk person. So you could do that. Another good tip, which I tend to suggest for many patients with blood cancers traveling overseas is to take a copy of your last clinic letter when you go with you and maybe have that folded up and keep it in your wallet, just in case you have to see a doctor uh, when you're in another country to, that shows what your diagnosis is, what medicines you're on from a hematology perspective. Um, and once or twice patients have said that's been quite helpful in terms of getting medical advice. Um, I guess I wouldn't condone it, but the, 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 the um, advanced prescription system is intended for um, a situation where you're at risk and where you uh, have an advanced prescription that you can keep at home and then present that to a pharmacy if you test positive for COVID-19. I suppose why I can't, wouldn't endorse that at all. A pharmacy has no way of knowing if you're telling the truth or not, if you tell them that you have just tested positive for COVID-19, um, but that would be a bit um, duplicitous. So, I, I'm, But yeah, there's the, I'm not aware of a particular way for you to self-purchase a dose, a, a course of Paxlovid to take them when you're overseas. And just a general caution with this medicine, Paxlovid is a, a great medicine. It's very effective against COVID-19 um, and, and many people feel a lot better after starting taking it. Two things of caution. One of them is it has got a lot of, one reason that you can't um, buy it without a, a careful consultation with a trained pharmacist is it does interfere with a lot of other medicines, including some hematology medicines like venetoclax or ibrutinib that people, some people might be taking. So you have to be quite careful about it. It's got a lot of what we call drug interactions. So that's why a doctor or a pharmacist has to be involved. They have to know what other medicines you're taking to make sure it's okay to take. Um, it, 
it does have a dose modification if you've got bad kidney function. So that's another thing that, you know, it's not something that they really want everybody to be taking willy nilly because you have to be a bit careful about it with that. And the third thing, just be aware of with Paxlovid, it's, it, uh, it's, it, it's, you take it for a week and um, almost everybody with COVID feels a lot better while they're taking it. But sometimes it's well described with some people whose immune system is weakened that after stopping it, you know, a few days or a week or two later, the symptoms rebound again. So if you are taking Paxlovid and you feel better, any symptoms come back, you know, you may need to retest yourself afterwards because you can get that rebound. In some people, particularly immune compromised, it doesn't always clear the infection completely and the symptoms bound, bound again afterwards. And some people may need um, you know, an extra, a second course of antivirals or even the intravenous antivirals that we can use in hospitals. So just a bit of caution with it. It's not, it's a great, a very useful medicine, but it does, there's there are reasons why, why it requires that pharmacist or, or GP or, or hospital specialist oversight. Mm. Thanks, Rob. That ties into another question we had about uh, Paxlovid and the renal function test. So obviously it sounds like that's routine to need to have had a renal function test in the last year. Um, is that sufficient, like a year within a year? Um, uh, yes, yes. I mean, is it sufficient? It's a compromise, really. I mean, we can't rule out the possibility your kidney function has gone off between now and then, but it's um, it, it's 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 what the government settled on for their advice because if they require that it was within three months then suddenly that'd be lots of people not getting it so it is a bit of a compromise i mean if you were new that you're you've had something happen to you that is likely to affect your kidney function between now and then then you probably should have had a test more recently than that but um yeah they they, they picked on that compromise because for example with people with diabetes or people with mild kidney impairment the standard is that that's monitored annually so that's why they went with one year as the recommendation so yeah it's it's some of these things are pragmatic. Mm. Sure. Um, does lenalidomide make us more immunocompromised? I guess, are they in that high risk grouping or not so much? Um, interesting question. Um, Cause lenalidomide in some ways can actually improve immune responses. Um, uh, Antibody responses are not awful if you're on lenalidomide. Um, I'd be more worried about the steroids that some people take alongside lenalidomide um, or the chemotherapy if you're taking it with cyclophosphamide as well, for example. But I would say if you've got if you're on lenalidomide, most people will be on it because they're on it as maintenance for myeloma. Um, that the fact that you're on treatment for myeloma will put you in a higher highest risk group. And so I'd be taking quite a lot of precautions. Mm -hmm. It's a personal judgment as to whether you think though that that is worth you wearing an N95 mask day in and day out. You might've seen in, in the media, um, there's a paucity, there's a, there's, a, there's a lack of really good evidence of exactly how much those masks reduce your risk of picking up COVID-19. And that's probably because the masks are hard to wear really well. Like if there's an air leak around them, they don't work so well. Um, I would say if you're going to, if you, if you're very risk averse on this, you want to both be wearing a mask and look at some of those videos online about how to put them on to make sure you're getting a good seal. Um, and they are, you know, we have to wear them at work in the hospital. You know, I appreciate they're uncomfortable to wear for long periods of time. Um, and it, it would be an individual judgment about where you, how you see that. Um, and I, 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 if I was in that position, I probably would wear one when I was in those really enclosed environments with lots of people. But I might be making a judgment call from round with a few friends who you know are, are not unwell for dinner. I, I might just get on and enjoy myself and just ask them to let me know in advance if they've got cough or cold symptoms. Because, you know, I'm aware there's also downsides to, to missing out on social interaction. Um, and I think it's a very personal one. I'm not sure I can make a hard and fast rule around that as to where, where the... Um, the boundary should lie. Yeah. Um, how long do I have to wait after having COVID to get the bivalent booster? I would be suggesting about three months. Um, the reason is if you've just had a recent COVID, that's that's infection, that's probably even better matched to the current strains than the, the vaccine is. But I would wait at least six weeks and probably three months before getting that bivalent booster. Um, uh, and I think three months is what it says at the moment in the in the recommendations. Cool. Thank you. Um, someone's asked here, by recent bone marrow transplant, uh, do you mean within a year? Would you consider that recent? I think that relates to the immunosuppression, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it depends what kind of transplant, really. So if it's an autologous stem cell transplant, um, a lot of a lot of the immune reconstitution is um, done by three months. So um, you do see a lot of recovery of the lymphocytes even as soon as three months after that transplant. Um, 
Having said that, you know, it's not a one moment in time, it's a gradual recovery. Um, and so I would say um, I, I would be particularly cautious in the first three months after an autologous transplant, and then perhaps begin to ease those off um, between three months and a year. If it's more than a year ago, I would, after an autograft, I wouldn't be too worried. Allogeneic stem cell transplantations are different. The, the immune recovery is usually a lot slower than that and is particularly um, slower if um, you're still on cyclosporin or steroids because you've had graft versus host disease, for example, and then the immune recovery is, then you, then you really are quite immune compromised. And certainly we've seen some patients with chronic graft versus host disease get quite sick with COVID-19. So um, for an allograft, um, I'd be considering at, you know, at least the first six months, if not the first year, as being a, a, a particularly high risk period. And even if it's longer than a year, but you've got chronic graft versus host disease and you're on steroids or, or, or ongoing cyclosporin, you probably are in quite a high risk group and you should be particularly careful. Sure. Thanks, Rob. I know we're getting close to when we need to finish. A few more questions. Uh, has there been a link between long COVID and high ferritin levels over a thousand? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, so so, so um, high ferritin levels for most patients with blood cancer, high ferritin levels would be because of blood transfusions, actually, um, and uh, and and probably aren't a major um, risk factor. Um, high ferritin levels can also happen as part of a response to inflammation, so it is plausible that some types of long COVID might be associated with, might lead to high ferritin levels. I'm not aware that there's any. So the classic cause of high ferritin levels um, in in non blood cancer patients is hemochromatosis, which is a genetic condition where you run high ferritin levels. I'm not aware of a, a link between hemochromatosis and long COVID, but I could be wrong. It's not something I've, I've read about that much. Um, no one. No one really understands long COVID that well, unfortunately. It's, it, it's probably not one condition, but a range of different things. Some of them are an immune overreactivation, over over response to the virus. Some of them may be due to some kind of long-term carriage of the virus somewhere in the body. Um, some of it might be due to organ damage from the vi from a, having a severe infection in the first place. So some people that have had COVID, particularly got very sick with it, might have kidney impairment or lung impairment or, or even cardiac impairment from the infection itself. And it's very difficult to disentangle all of those factors. And probably in many people, there's several of those overlapping. I'm afraid even in countries that have put huge amounts of money into long COVID clinics, no, no, I don't think, I think it's fair to say no one really knows quite what to do with it. And it's an area um, that, that, that some groups have done a lot of research in. I, I'm, I'm not very optimistic. There'll be some amazing answers to all of that because um, there are other post-viral syndromes as well, um, uh, like, like um, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, where it, 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 it's been very elusive to find a particular solution. So I'm afraid I'm not an expert in that, and uh, I'm not aware of the, the particular links with ferritin. Thanks, Rob. Um, can you take Paxlovid more than once if you get COVID again? Yes, you can. Yes, yes. So, 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 um, the good news about Paxlovid, so far at least, is that as the virus mutates, the thing that's changing the most is the spike protein, which is on the outside of the virus, and that's because it's evolving to get around population immunity. Um, what doesn't seem to be changing as quickly, although it's changing a little bit, is the inside machinery of the virus, the machinery that it uses to replicate. And Paxlovid targets that machinery it uses to, to, to replicate or, or get in and out of cells. So, so um, fortunately, even the newest variants seem to still remain sensitive to Paxlovid. And you can have Paxlovid um, multiple times and it can still be effective. So yes is the answer to that. And uh, um, and, you know, I've certainly had, had patients who've had it two or three times and um, uh, and it can be used again if necessary. Mm. Um, and just the last one, we do have a, a few more questions, but we do need to keep to time here today. So for those of you that um, haven't been able to uh, have your questions answered, please feel free to send them through to me and yeah. we can um, do our best to get them answered for you. 
And can I, can um, I just answer, Nikki, sorry to interrupt you. I know you've got to go soon, but just as, 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 sorry, just scanning through a few questions about flu vaccine. Yes, get the flu vaccine as well, because if you're at risk of COVID, you're probably also at risk of flu. Um, the data so far, at least from the CDC in America, is that it does appear to be safe to have both vaccines on the same day if you wanted to. However, at a practical level, I tend to recommend that people space them by a couple of weeks. And my that's that's my personal advice. And the reason I tend to recommend that is if you have a reaction to a vaccine, vaccine and you've had them both on the same day you won't know what you reacted against and you won't know what to do next time the viruses come around so if um so you can get them both together if you want to just get it over and done with uh, uh, the 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 big 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 agencies are saying they're monitoring for side effects of that and they do say it's safe on the other hand if if it's not a particular issue for you to space them out and you can then i probably tend to recommend giving it a couple of weeks between so that if you feel awful after one of the vaccines you don't blame it on the covid vaccine when it was a flu vaccine or vice versa uh, and and because the reality is it's likely that most of us will need to keep having boosters intermittently every year or so against covid or uh, and flu and it can be useful to know what you did and didn't react to Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rob. We appreciate your time today. I know you've got some um, appointments and things you need to get to. So thank you so much for joining us. We um, are always amazed at your ability to present information so um, easily understood and, and so get through so many questions as well. And thank you for your generous time um, supporting LBC and all the patients that are joining us today and those that will um, watch this webinar later on. And of course, all the care that you give all the patients and the many different aspects of your role. We really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today. And for those that have joined us live online, thanks for joining us as well. Thanks, Nikki. And thanks all for your time. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye-bye.